Our lesson from the Hebrew Bible today comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. This is what Isaiah, Amos' son, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of the mountains. It will be lifted above the hills, and people will stream to it. Many nations will go and say, Come, let us go to the Lord's mountain, to the house of Jacob's God, so that he may teach us his ways, and we may walk in God's paths. Instructions will come from Zion. The Lord's word from Jerusalem. God will judge between the nations and settle disputes of mighty nations. Then they will beat their swords into iron plows and their spears into pruning hooks, tools. Nation will not take up sword against nation. They will no longer learn how to make war. Come, house of Jacob, let's walk by the Lord's light. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I left for home, all I had were my clothes, a little mini fridge, and a funky 1970s looking chair that had like a twin bed in it that folded out. I I remember the first day moving in thinking, that's my whole life right there. My whole life in the back of my parents' minivan. I was in the dorm less than an hour when I made my first acquisition. I purchased a frame for a loft bed that I could raise my bed up high to maximize the amount of space in my tiny dorm room. I I don't even think I had officially met my roommate yet before I was hauling this huge bed frame down the hall to my room. Oh, my roommate, Hugh was his name. I knew almost nothing about him going in. I I did know that he had a perfect score on his ACT and SAT. I knew that he was from Indiana or Ohio or Illinois, just, you know, one of the flat ones, one of those places. Indiana. Indiana? Okay. All right. I think you're right, Charlie. (laughs) Hugh was a quirky fella. He'd take hour-long showers in the morning. We had this suite that had four of us sharing one shower, but he'd take hour-long showers. It was wonderful. (laughs) I'd come home late at night, back to the room, or any time in the evening, and I would find Hugh laying on his bed, rolled onto his side with his face right up against the wall away from me. It took me weeks to realize that he was actually on the phone the entire time that he was lying there. I had no clue. Apparently, he was the world's quietest talker or just a really good listener on the phone. I found out weeks later when some of my friends were asking me, how come I never answered the phone in our dorm room? And here's the part that always killed me. The whole time that he was on the phone, it was with a girl who is in the same school as us who lived on campus. Why walk around talking with someone for hours in person when you can lay silently, motionless on your bed, whisper talking to them? A funny thing happened at the end of that first year of school. My life that had been so neatly packed into my parents' minivan, it couldn't fit in that minivan anymore. I had to rent a storage area along with some friends so we could store all of our treasures. You know what I'm talking about? Third-hand couches, terrible dorm room lighting and rugs and decorations, an assortment of mini fridges, hand-me-down TVs, and and that might might not seem like a big deal, but this is back in the day where any TV over 27 inches required Herculean feats of strength to move it around. It's not like this pattern stopped after that first year of school. Every year I'd accumulate more stuff, requiring more and more storage to keep it over the summer. In graduate school, when I lived in this large apartment on campus, stuff kept growing. Now I had a bed, I had multiple couches, I had kitchen supplies, I had a table and chairs. I got my own place after graduation. I'd add a home gym and musical equipment. I got married and two people's stuff were thrown together. 
And while you would go through that season of seeing who had the better stuff and then getting rid of the bad stuff, the pile of stuff just kept growing. And oh man, then you got a kid. And there's this exponential explosion in the amount of stuff that you have in your life. A whole new room of furniture, blankets after blankets after blankets after blankets. I kid you not, in our living room right now, there's an ottoman. And in it contains no less than 15 blankets that have never been used. (laughs) Because she's got eight other blankets up in her room. Car seats. Strollers, not just one stroller, not the everyday stroller. You got to get the travel stroller as well, the high chair, the portable high chair, play mats, diaper bags, and literally a machine that just goes shh. Of all the things, that was the lifesaver right there. Ashley and I, we've, we've tried to live relatively simple lives over the year. We've gone through periods of time where we've tried to challenge each other just don't buy anything. And we splurged here and there, and occasionally the villain known as Target would ensnare us with her web of affordable, attractive home decor. But we feel, honestly, like we've tried to keep things a little more toward the simple end of the spectrum. And yet, when the moving truck came to our house in our previous town in late May to move us here to Nashville, we filled every inch of that 26-foot moving truck so full that the back door almost couldn't close, and we had to leave stuff behind for weeks until we could come back and get it. It's depressing. How did we get so much stuff? How did it build up without us realizing it. It just snuck up on us. And it wasn't until we moved here and had to find space in a moving truck and had to find space in a new house to put everything in that we fully understood how much stuff we had and how little room we had for anything new. I think the season of Advent functions like that for us. We're all packing up. We're moving. We're headed to Jerusalem, waiting with anticipation for the arrival of a Christ child. Advent is often called Little Lent because many of those themes are the same. It's this season of preparation. It should be a time where we take a look at our lives and see if we're making room in them for the good stuff. Or are our lives so full of the stuff that's built up over the years that we no longer have any room for hope or peace or joy or love? So that's exactly what we're going to do over the next four weeks together. We're going to look at our lives and look at the stuff we've accumulated, the scar tissue, the wounds, the priorities, the blind spots, the experiences, the relationships. We're going to look at them and we're going to look at the stuff that's getting in the way of us clearing out space for that good stuff, the joy, the hope, the love, the peace. If I ask you, what's the quintessential word for Christianity? Many of you would probably say love. Maybe some would say grace. Maybe some of you hardcore, old-school, reformed people would say covenants or providence. But I'd argue that the quintessential word for the Christian faith is hope. The scholar N.T. Wright actually wrote a whole book about it called Surprise by Hope. And in it, he talks about hope being the defining feature of our faith. Christianity literally changed the definition of that word, hope. That word we have in scripture translated as hope, it's elpis. In the ancient Greco-Roman world, it didn't mean hope as we understood it, it just meant expectations. The thing is the expectation could be good or it could be bad, the one thing it couldn't be was neutral. Now, we'd never say, my hope is to drive home today and find that our house is knocked over by a tornado. We'd never say that. My hope is to be stuck on 440 some point this week for three hours. (laughs) 
We'd never say things like that. But in the ancient world, hope was merely your expectations about the future. Not a wish, not a positive feeling, just an expectation. Maybe a good one, but oftentimes back then, maybe a bad one. So when Christians started using that word, el peace, about their expectations for the future, they would often attach a word to it. They'd say, el peace agape, hope with love. You know, agape, the highest form of love, el peace agape, an expectation of a love-filled future. The passage that I read earlier from Isaiah is often called the floating oracle of peace. It's a funny term, isn't it? The floating oracle of peace. And the reason we call it that is because it actually appears other places in scriptures. Other prophets have said remarkably similar words. Micah 4, 1 through 3 is the most prominent example. It, and, and the story paints this beautiful picture of hope and peace. And what's interesting to me is something that I missed about this for years and years and only recently noticed. This isn't a prophetic teaching of Isaiah. This isn't something he heard or imagined or God spoke to him. Notice, it's something he saw. This is what Isaiah, Amos' son, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it begins with that vision of Mount Zion towering above the highest mountains. And when, whether Isaiah means the entirety of Jerusalem or the Temple Mount or Mount Zion, that's a little bit away from that. We don't know exactly what he saw, but whatever it was, it was very tall, taller than any other mountain. And if you've ever been to Jerusalem, you know that it is a city up in the mountains. As you drive from the coast down at Tel Aviv up into the city, you gradually climb through the hills. But it's not just one hill or one mountain, it's a whole series of hills and mountains on a plateau. And because of this, being in the city can be really disorienting. No road is straight. To get from here to there requires ups and downs and turns. And sometimes you can see the Temple Mount far off. Sometimes you can see the Mount of Olives, but then it's obscured by another hill. And so this vision of God's mountain being higher than every other mountain is striking because even if you were just in Jerusalem, you'd understand now everybody can see it. And not just the people in Jerusalem, everywhere in the world, you couldn't get lost no matter how far you were away. There it was, visible. And that's the vision Isaiah sees when he sees people from all over the world. They see this mountain, they say, let's go there. Let's climb this mountain. Let's see if God can teach us God's ways. Show us how to live. He could see people from the four corners of the earth, every nation, streaming to this holy mountain. And when they get there, they find what they're looking for. Isn't that a breath of fresh air? They find what they're looking for. God's word, God's judgment, God's instruction. God's settling dispute among the nations. People are taking their weapons of war and hammering them and pounding them into new shapes, into plows to care for the fields, into hooks to care for the plants. And the final image of Isaiah's vision is an invitation where the prophet pulls us into that vision, inviting us to come into that vision, to come and journey with him. Come, let's go up that mountain. Let's head to the house of God. Let's walk by the Lord's light. Hope. Mm, it's such a tricky word because language is squishy. It changes. It's transient. But this hope that we see here in Isaiah's vision, the hope demonstrated in the book of Acts, the hope Paul's talking about when he says faith, hope, and love, that type of hope is a little different from the way we use the word. I don't know about you, but it seems to me when we say the word hope, we often just mean something you wish for. Not necessarily an expectation of something that you think is going to happen. It's something that you'd like to see happen. It's a wish for the best possible outcome, a realization of a dream, some lofty goal that you hope to achieve. 
I can't help but think of Panica, the disco's hit song from last year of, called High Hopes. It said, I had to have high, high hopes for a living, shooting for the stars, what I couldn't make a killing, didn't have a dime, but I always had a vision, always had high, high hopes. Just seems like a wish or a goal. But when a Christian talks about hope, it's not a wish. It's not a desire. It's an expectation. El peace agape. Hope means having the expectation that our futures are ultimately defined by love. That's why scholars call hope in the Christian sense an eschatological gift. Meaning that even though God's love and God's justice have not fully come, we experience a foretaste of that when we hope our futures are ultimately defined by love. God will prevail. Love wins. And when we come to expect that, that is hope. And so when we begin to understand hope in that way, it becomes a little more clear how we push that out of our lives. Maybe it's not fully out of your house yet. Maybe it's simply stuck up in the attic next to the Halloween decorations. Or maybe it's out in the shed waiting for the spring to get a little use. How do we create room for hope? How do we create space to place hope prominently in our lives? How do we get that expectation of love? I think what's interesting is Advent and Christmas, it drops hints all around us because we are primed for a big big event. Even if we don't believe in Jesus, even if we aren't celebrating his birth, our culture is priming us because something big is happening. It's everywhere. There's a sense that something could happen, something magical. You could talk to animated deer. A whiff of the possibility that the miraculous could happen. And what it does is it exposes exposes in us a profound yearning for something deeper. So think about it. We, We tend to have nostalgia about the Christmases of our past when we were kids. And then when we're around kids, we tend to idolize the wonder and naivety of children around Christmas. It's a theme that's picked up over and over in our movies, whether it's George Bailey or Ebenezer Scrooge or Buddy the Elf. The story is the same. We want to believe in our core being that once again, impossible things are possible. But our lives, we got years of disappointment. We've been let down, we've been lied to, we've been used, unseen, mistreated. We've tried and we failed. Maybe we're not where we thought we'd be. We filled our lives with other values, maybe like getting ahead at work, climbing that corporate ladder. We're concerned with status or power and looking successful, having the right friends, visiting the best places, making that Instagram look perfect. And these things have made us cynical. And so we hedge our bets, thinking, if I want something good in my life, I'm going to have to get it. I'm going to have to do it on my own. So maybe you've not gone full Ebenezer Scrooge, but I trust that we can all admit to some degree we got some cynicism in us. You might call it something different. Maybe you put a nicer word on it. You'd say, I'm a realist. I'm a pragmatist. I'm just being practical, but whatever we call it, cynicism takes up some of that space where hope should have in our lives. It shoves it out, and along with it, the joyful expectation that our futures will be defined by love. 
I heard an interview a few months ago from the famous social worker and clinical researcher, author Brene Brown, where she describes hope as being a cognitive behavioral sequence. She describes it as having three aspects. You have to have a goal, you have to have a pathway to that goal, and you have to have the agency to reach that goal. That's the way she describes hope. And she went on to say that hope is the opposite of despair. She actually used Rob Bell's definition of despair, which is fascinating. It says, despair is believing that tomorrow will be just like today. Every year, our family, like many other families, sends out Christmas cards. And every year, it's a joke. Some would say a point of contention in our house. As we wrangle over the photos that are in the card. Now, don't get me wrong, I care about the pictures on the Christmas card, but only to a certain threshold. Am I fully clothed? Am I smiling? Is the picture in focus? That's about it. I'm good. (laughs) I'm kidding a little bit. I do care a little more about how those pictures look. I do want our family to look nice, attractive, happy. We feel that way. We want to present ourselves as being all right. And I'm not going to mock that notion. I'm not going to knock large family get-togethers where everyone's instructed to wear certain outfits. That way the picture looks perfect. I'm not going to mock family potlucks and parties where people travel enormous distances to eat food made by aunts and uncles who think they've cracked the code on the world's best casserole. We put ourselves all through this ritual at some point in our lives, spending time with people we know we're going to argue with, spending time with people that drive us crazy at times. But underneath it all, we got to admit there is something earnest, a desire that maybe one day, maybe this year, we're going to get along. Maybe this year that perfect photo is actually backed up by the family that gets along. Harmony across divisions. For each family, it's like having a version of the Christmas truce. Maybe it's something that'll just roll over into the new year. Maybe something will be different for the swords of family warfare to be beaten into plowshares, the spears into pruning hooks. As a family, we've already been to two different Christmas spectacles, and I'm sure more are coming. We've been to Zoo Illumination and its Christmas village out at the zoo. This past Wednesday, we went to Cheekwood to see the lights and the reindeer. We all decorate to some degree, some more than others. Some of us have entire rooms of our houses dedicated to storing the enormous amounts of Christmas decorations that we put up every year to cover every inch of our house. Some of us have six Christmas trees. Some of us, not to mention names, Stephen Nix, has Christmas trees that spin in their house. It's very impressive, Stephen. Maybe you have a family tradition of driving around looking at the lights. Perhaps there's that one house, you know the one. Every neighborhood has one. The house that triples their electric bill every December because they're trying to make it so their house is seen from space. And the house rides that amazing thin line of being beautiful and a little bit trashy. (laughs) Those are the best houses. This season is a spectacle. Sights, sound, color. And it too comes from a deeper place, a deeper yearning for something so grand as to see the mountain of the Lord high above every mountain. To see the people of the earth from every nation so captivated by that vision that they're streaming to it, to be in the presence of God. Despair really is the opposite of hope. That's why I don't mock these attempts to heal old wounds. That's why I don't want to mock being captivated by a spectacle because they are earnest attempts to capture something more, something deeper. And if we're going to make room for hope, we're going to have to clear 
out enough space in our lives for hope to have its proper place in the center of our homes. It means we're going to have to grapple with despair. And this season is full of it. The parties, the business, the busyness, the spectacle of it all, while it might be captivating, it can also be a reminder of what we've lost. These visions of a war being over, of old wounds that are healing, of happiness and joy abounding, they seem preposterous, impossible. And honestly, the only fitting response when you first hear them is bafflement. How can joy be found with what I've been through? How can life be fulfilling after what I've lost? And yet, God's promise is still right there. Your future is defined by love. I can't divine for you what clearing out that space from despair looks like. Maybe hope itself just comes in and it's the mover. It moves it out for you. Maybe it's a long, gradual process. Maybe it just happens in a fell swoop. However it happens, I know that the promise of God remains. Your future is defined by love. Because love wins. There's something revolutionary about Isaiah's vision. It happens there at the end. Because when we seek God together, God will be present. Hope, when it comes, it always arrives with an invitation. An invitation to come along together and journey to God. An invitation to walk by the light of God. And what's so Wonderful and such great news is that this invitation is not far off. God's ultimate victory over fear and despair, yes, it's yet to come, but we can still participate in that gift of hope right here and right now. So go home today and start packing up cynicism. All that stuff in you that says it's all up to you, that there's no better possibilities out there. Pack it up, put it on the curb, clear out that space for hope. The expectation that your future is defined by love. So go home today and find that door that you don't want to open, that messy room of despair. That room is so cluttered and so messy that cleaning it up is overwhelming. Go into that space and work on one small thing. Don't worry about the whole mess. Work on that one tiny corner. Clear out a little bit of space. A little bit of space that hope might grab a foothold in your life. Open that room and yourself up to the possibilities of the promises God has for you. Do you see it? Do you hear it? Swords beaten into plowshares. The darkness of this world, it's not going to prevail. Conflict is replaced with community. God's light will not be denied. The reign of God will come. There is hope. There is an expectation of love. So let's start moving out some of this junk. This stuff that we've accumulated over the years that isn't doing us any good. Let's make room for the confidence that comes with hope holy expectations. We don't have to be cynical. We don't have to be divided. We don't have to be estranged. We're not stuck with despair. We're not bound by fear. Tomorrow will be different from today because we have an expectation that our futures are filled with love. So may we have hope. Amen.